This is a free podcast from the BBC. For more information, you can go to our website, bbc.co.uk slash radio2. Tracy de Jong Eglin is writing from, uh, from far the Netherlands. We spent the Easter break in Aberdeen at a wedding. Oh, you guys, you know how to live. <laughs> During the meal, the discussion turned to MasterChef shouts large. And there were people who'd never seen it, but admitted uh, that their knowledge came from comments in your programme. Just over 48 hours in Scotland, and I didn't eat a single rowie. Oh, them's a die, will be the lucky ones. And speaking of cookery programmes, what's Delia about? Delia is about her business. That's what Delia's about. Is it a cookery programme or a football programme? <laughs> I don't know. We do get a lot of, of Delia's chums and the football and Norwich and... Uh, I mean, for example, if we buy Gordon Ramsay cookbooks, we're show-offs. Well, no, Sir Tracy, I buy them for the pictures of Gordon. If we buy an Igelis cookbooks, it's because we're family-orientated. And if we buy a Delia book, is it because we're football hooligans who survive on tinned mints? How nice of you to grace us with your presence here today, if only for a week or two until you go away. How good of you to be here when you could be on an outing, or rather be at home to do some tiling and some grouting. We'll think... <laughs> I would expect no more, nor no less from you. I'm glad to be back, and as I say, I hope you all had a happy Easter. I know that um, there was a fair amount of what can only be described as bleak and snow and ice and that very unseasonal. Today, uh, says Bill Sattler, I thought it was yesterday, but however, according to Bill, 24th, what's today's date? Oh, there was yesterday. They're lighting the torch at Olympus be carried to Beijing. Yes, indeed. Some years ago, we visited the original site of the Olympics and were shown the altar where the, the dead leaves are left in the sun and they catch fire and they used to light the torch carried by the runners to the games. And Bill Sadler says, someone asked the guide, which were the first modern games where the ceremony took place? Uh, 1936 Berlin Olympics. And my lovely lady asked, was that the games where Hitler walked out when Jesse Matthews won all the medals? I think you know he wasn't a million miles off the truth. <laughs> I'm worried about Jim. And Graham Reaper <laughs> says, New research shows that showbiz kids with unusual names. Zowie Bowie. He couldn't wait to change his name, could he? Yeah, with unusual names. will have the last laugh as their handles will get them on in life. And furthermore, names with royal connections are particular winners. So, says Graham Reaper, as I said to my son, King Henry VIII, last night, who's laughing now, boy? And I just called, says Lash, Lash Bosholm, I just called a, a bank 24-hour service centre on Easter Saturday and recorded voice told me they closed until Tuesday. <laughs> 24-hour service centre. And Barbara, Ian as we speak, is making her way across the North Yorkshire moors. God, I hope the weather is clement for you, Barbara. I hope it's not coming down in, in buckets on top of you. But anyway, safe journey. And this is this is from the son-in-law. Hmm? Thinks highly of you. Uh, BBC TV Breakfast News is an endless source of excitement. Yes, indeed. I'm sorry I miss it. And this morning's little gem I saw while eating my whole grain cereal with one of my five portions of fruit, as instructed. <laughs> You'll live forever, Gordon. It's Gordon Zola. Uh, centred round the Glastonbury Festival, apparently last year. And this is where the story really starts. The tented hordes left the metal tent pegs in the ground, which killed the cows. My oh, heavens, who presumably fought to the death using them as weapons. And the answer is to provide the happy campers now with biodegradable tent pegs. Seven million of them. And the cows have clubbed together to give the inventor a thank you gift. Guess what? A warm pat on the back. And Des Custard of Tunbridge Wells. Good morning, Des. I heard in the news they suggested treating bad temper on the NHS. <laughs> If they could only find a computer that worked instead of flashing up error messages, a wife who didn't move things from where you left them, and a road that hasn't been dug up yet, there'd be no need. And then there's the drink. Never try to cut down on the drink. <laughs> oh, it does. I was amused, says Saunders of Bungay, and it takes quite a lot to amuse old Saunders. He's a crusty old curmudgeon. I was amused by the criticism I read of number one ladies' detective agency. Uh, yes, well, Sarah felt rather very strongly about that. Some journos obviously find it insufficiently bleak. <laughs> well, it, the books are not bleak, are they? No. 
And uh, absence of bleakness, however, says Saunders, wasn't a problem last night in East Enders. A nice night out ended up an epic, with a premature burial and a mad scene, rather than pie and mash in the Mile End Road. Now, he says, I'm all for the writers of East Enders stealing from Poi and Shakespeare... <laughs> Perhaps they could nick a bit from P.G. Woodhouse from time to time. And let's hope none of them have read Titus Andronicus. <laughs> no, otherwise we're really in trouble. Now look, Courtney Biggins lately said, I thought I'd share with you a cautionary tale which occurred while the present uh, Mrs. Biggins lately and I were returning from a visit to Australia via Bangkok. That's not how you spell Bangkok, uh, Courtney. I had two days stopover, and the day of our flight, the good lady announced she was going shopping and I could please myself for a few hours. So, and the massage parlour was respectable looking, and I inquired as to the price of a massage. And a very pleasant Thai girl told me, a thousand dollars. That's a bit expensive. I was thinking of spending about two, two hundred. Well, she said, that's the price. Take it or leave it. Anyway, I didn't bother. Later in the day, the good lady, Lady and I were out in the front of the hotel waiting for our cab when I heard a shout from the other side of the road. It was the Thai girl. There you go. See what you get for your two hundred dollars. After watching the penultimate episode of Ashes to Ashes with the unlikely scene of someone listening to your show. Yes, I'm getting to interfere with a lot of television lately. I was wondering, uh, couldn't you have chosen more realistic roles, such as the radio host in the recent production of The Passion, where Judas tunes in to find out how Ben Hur did in the chariot races? Yeah, I thought that was very successful, The Passion. Uh, Oliver, that was from Oliver. And I know you're trying to live up to the cardigan-wearing masses of togs and tinks. Yes, they are out there, the heaving masses. But your secret is out. We heard you on Ashes to Ashes last week, you cool dude. Does it make me a cool dude? <laughs> I thought it made me a thing of the past. Uh, Dr. Anna, anaesthetic. All that banging on about Lark Rise and Cranford, and all the time you're hanging out with Gene Hunt and his Audi. What, next we're going to see you with eyeliner, playing Ultravox? Now, I write on behalf of Perseverance. This is all about Ashes to Ashes, dust to dust who, under heavy sedation in St. Togg's General, after watching Ashes to Ashes, and Keely Hawes in her tight jeans and white cowboy boots. So could, could you ask them to show it after Percy has had his medication? And uh, yeah, ever one to be on the cutting edge? Uh, James Burton Stewart heard me on Ashes to Ashes, and uh, he's very keen on Keely. And he, she, when, when she heard me on the, on the radio, you see, because it's all supposed to be 1981, she says, Thanks, Terry. And then the other fella, um, <laughs> clearly not a dog, says, 20,000 nicked and mentioned on Junior Choice by Ed Stewart. What have things come to? Yeah, you see, the man's an idiot. A <laughs> gobdoll. And James Burton Stewart points out that anyway, by 1981, Ed Stewart was not doing Junior Choice. So, <clears throat> Sarah and I will be moaning the fact that being the old crusty codgers we are, we're no longer asked anywhere. I mean, the present Lady Wogan and I, we don't live a million miles away from Windsor Castle. You think someone might have still peaked, is how you'd, you'd describe us. And, and Sarah herself is not unpeaked, in view of the fact that she does not appear to be among the distinguished ladies, the like of Davina McCall, who've been asked to the lunch. <laughs> Well, as I said, <laughs> you know, it, it's not you, it's, it's all of us. As I sat huddled by the fire on Easter Monday, watching the hailstones flatten the daffodils and the snow fallen off the conservatory roof, and this is a cheery word for the a harbinger of spring, all of a sudden came the sound of green sleeves, and around the corner, an ice cream van. Ah, oh, it sort of gives you a warm glow. And, uh, yes, don't think we haven't noticed this, being ignored on all sides. Donegal. First we had Dan Cruikshank around the world in 80 treasures. Then Monty Don, who knows a good thing when he sees one, and has a good old sigh about it, uh, jumped on the bandwagon with 80 gardens. And I've spotted Little Erna, as well as a free holiday, for you in Barrowlands. Yes, and Miss Tara could come along as well, because I know she's extremely put out. Around the world in 80 dinners. Well, I think Matthew Fort is doing that for the, for the great British whatever, isn't he? <laughs> why, not, why not me? Why not you, Barrowlands? Why not Sarah Kennedy? Hmm? You know, 
you couldn't sit down to... We all around the world and 80 dinners does have a smack to it, though, doesn't it? You would have duck in Peking, chicken in Madras, prawns down in Sydney, the same in Dublin. Uh, what you have in Vietnam is up to you. Oh, exactly. <laughs> and Lahore. And you could finish up with stews in Limerick. So wasn't that where I was born? And delicious they were. And uh, just listening to the best bits of your wireless broadcast on iPod. Yes, the best kept secret on the BBC. There is an iPod every week, marshalled uh, by none other than Marilyn's Boyd. 35 minutes of sheer pleasure on an iPod. And how it come? How come it only lasts 25 minutes? And your show is on for hours and hours. The music. It's the music, Ken. I think. And there are, here are five things you shouldn't do when you live in a home with a bunch of dogs. Nobody lives at home with a bunch of dogs. You might, if you're really unlucky, live with one or maybe two. But a bunch? Uh, don't put the hairspray and the deodorant on the same surface in the bathroom. No, I absolutely agree with that one. I <laughs> Always put your glasses on before you start cutting anything. These are words of wisdom. Don't sit in a room with more than two people. No, that's true. The conversation gets confusing. I can't, oops, okay, say that again? Uh, don't ever take your false teeth out in company. You may never see them again. And finally, don't bend over after you've eaten a big meal. Are you the same, Teddy? Well, you see, there's a lot of people out there pretending to be me. Or maybe with the, with the same name, who wish they weren't. Are you the same, Terry Wogan, who delivers pizza on a moped in the Croydon area? I might be. Ah, well, I'm still waiting for me garlic bread, says Mr. E. Train. Don't expect a tip this time. My pizza's now cold and the fizzy pop has gone flat. Yours is a life entirely given over to pleasure, isn't it, Mr. E. Train? Perhaps if you stopped moonlighting on the radio, you'd be able to concentrate on your proper job. Well, I, as you say, I can't be everywhere. I do my best down to Croydon on the old moped. I've been reading the Times Reader's blog on the internet. I've never read a blog in my life, and I will never do a blog in my life. And, you know, I've never looked at YouTube. I've never been on eBay, and I've never been in a caravan in my life. Anyway, regarding the UK being the seventh best place to live, according to the United Nations... <laughs> If, could we have some more, another more credible organisation, please? And when I came across the addition to this debate, every year the UK is ranked near the bottom of the Eurovision Song Contest because no one likes us. Please, could America be allowed to enter as a one-off? Then the UK wouldn't come last. Thanks. T. Wogan, London, UK. Are you allowed to venture into the arena of international debate? Is this a fake or is there another T. Wogan? Oh, dear. What a terrible thought. Now, I, you may have heard these before. Some of them are amusing, though. Nat West... Lost in Translation. A very overrated movie, incidentally. I thought you might like this. Some examples of public signs in front. We've all heard them, but some of these are, are quite funny. We've all come across them. On the menu of a Polish hotel. Salad in a firm's own make. Limpid red beet soup with cheesy dumplings in the form of a finger. Roasted duck let loose. Beef rashers beaten up in the country people's fashion. That's the way. And the Hong Kong tailor shop. Ladies may have a fit upstairs. And in the room laundry, ladies, leave your clothes here and spend the afternoon having a good time. In Copenhagen Airline Ticket Office, take your bags. Sorry, we take your bags and send them in all directions. What ho, me old velvet-voiced vicar. What is it, Chuffer? Chuffer Dandridge, Shakespeare and actor manager, still awaiting the white fiver. I think the bee but to be commended for the religious theme running through EastEnders over the Easter. Max Branning was buried by Tanya on Good Friday and miraculously rose again on Easter Monday. Well done, Auntie. A little bit of Easter message for the knuckle-draggers, too dim to watch actual religious programming. Well spotted yourself, Chuffer. Takes a good one to know one, doesn't it? Yes, we saw yesterday the Bevan boys, didn't we? Celebrating the services of those Bevan boys who took a lot of abuse during the war for being conchies. Uh, why aren't you out fighting? Because I'm doing something probably even more dangerous, digging coal. And Jimmy Savile, who's well known for being well known, yes, I suppose it was inevitable that he'd pop up with a big cigar, which never seemed to be lit. Yeah. However, we should remember that, among others, another Bevan boy was Eric Morecambe. Was he? I never knew that. In Accrington, about a hundred yards from the town hall, which has been described as having a, 
<laughs> Queen Anne front and a Mary Anne back. <laughs> I didn't know that. Now isn't that extraordinary? I wonder was, I wonder was Ernie, a Bevan boy. I, and I saw an interesting opinion on BBC News on Monday. Really, how do you want to be sitting around a long time? It seems the secret of a happy marriage is for the woman to be better looking than the man. Ah, this is a secret known to many of us who are already punching above our weight at Boggy Marsh. Springs to mind. Oh, too true. Is the present Lady Wogan in danger from a George Clooney look-alike or safe with a Terry Wogan look-alike? Look, that woman in her time was known as the luckiest woman in Ireland, and for good reason. You're listening to the Wake Up to Wogan podcast from BBC Radio 2. You can even set the podcast up to be automatically updated on your computer when it becomes available each week, so you don't even have to remember to get it. Loose Morrow says, and this is striking the correct note in the present term, Entente cordiale atmosphere that pervades all here. Since Nicholas Sarkozy says we've entered a new era of Franco-English relations, he certainly knows how to butter us up, doesn't he, old, old President Sarkozy? I thought he'd like to know. I'm currently selling a French army rifle, which was made in 1941. It's never been fired. <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> No, wrong. Now look, as Sarah will already have told you, <laughs> nobody could get through the door today without a bevy of beauties from British Airways um, <laughs> brandishing all manner of unguents at them. And it's all to celebrate, I think, the British Airways, obviously. Uh, Terminal 5, designed around the needs of passengers. And the layout is such passengers travel in one direction and the plane goes in an, No, and in logical manner, from stage to stage. <laughs> well, this, honestly, it's like Oz, isn't it? It's, it's just, there's a wizard in there. And BA passengers can check in online. 150 fast bag drops and 96 self-service check-in desks and a fast ergonomic flow through security. <laughs> oh, all right then. I can hardly wait to get there. And keeping me fingers crossed. Saunders, good morning to you in Bungil. As Bungil's leading health and safety professional, I was interested. Yes, so he is. He's a health and safety man, Saunders. Yeah, I'll give you his full address so, so you can rush round there and beat him up. I was interested to see in my newspaper, well, that's a change, that noise levels on shows such as Children in Need would violate the new noise at work regulations. Ah. Uh -huh. This noise is caused, of course, by the audience actually enjoying themselves, which, let's face it, is not really allowed anymore. Uh, my newspaper further went on to tell me that celebrities... I'm a celebrity. I am in inverted commas, of course. Oh, yes. uh, such as Terry Wogan would need to wear ear defenders. Saunders says, I thought you already were. You may wish to note, if you're not already wearing them, that ear defenders for your lugs... Yes, well, that's enough of that. They are they're large, but they're handsome, would threaten the 25-kilogram guideline weights in the 1992 manual handling regulations. He goes on to detail the actual weight, and 82 dBs and all that kind of stuff, uh, with which I will not trouble you, because Sanders tends to go on a bit. And uh, Mahat. Good morning, Mahat. Mahat McCoat. Uh, you may have heard that Hillary Clinton misspoke the other day. Oh, I misspoke. Talk English woman, and said she had to run and dodge snipers' bullets. When, when in fact, uh, this was, I think, in Bosnia, Serbia, uh, she had to run and dodge snipers' bullets. When, in fact, she misspoke. What she meant to say was that she walked off a plane and accepted a posy of flowers from a little girl. Well, that's a sort of serious misspoke, isn't it? And uh, I read in the news this morning that the bones of the oldest known human have been found in Spain. I saw that. I saw that, Michael. Michael Estro. The bones are dated around 1.1 million years. Alongside the bones were found stone tools, animal bones, and a tog sticker. I do hope you can help me. I moved house a few months ago. Well, Wanda, something we said. And I've just received a letter from my energy supplier. Hmm. She'll remain nameless saying that they've cancelled, we all know who it is, which is saying that they've cancelled my account as they've been informed that there is someone else living at my address. Now, I've looked everywhere, onto the bed, the spare room, on no avail. The only living being is a huge spider who sits on the rug in front of the fire every night. 
Is it me? Oh, wonder. And she signed up for the Togs cruise. Heavens. Don't bring the spider. The good news is that being a Tog does have its benefits, says Alison. Alice in Ordnung. I was talking to my friend Alice Kla the other day. <laughs> you know, she said, it's okay to tell me all your secrets. I won't remember them anyway. And we've had a proliferation of what can only be described as the kind of thing that's going to set back the Entente Cordiale and probably send uh, um, Monsieur President and Sarkozy back to France in what could only be described as a huff. And Nosmo, Nosmo King says, uh, Remember General Norman Schwarzkopf? Oh, yes, the Desert Storm. Going to war without France is like going deer hunting without your accordion. And Alan Kent says, It's important to remember the French have always been there when they needed us. And the French government announced today it's imposing a ban on the use of fireworks at Euro Disney. The decision comes the day after a nightly fireworks display at the park, located just 30 miles outside of Paris, caused the soldiers at a nearby French army garrison to surrender to a group of Czech tourists. Hey, you were talking to Ken Bruce yesterday about yes, he occasionally uh, deigns to speak to me. And he's in now, and he's missed most of the pastries with which we were inundated by bevy of B.A. beauties a little earlier on, and all sorts of things for anti-aging creams and unguents for unmentionable parts. And very nice, too, all in praise of the new Terminal 5, which, of course, is going to be absolutely beautiful. You never hear that. A beautiful airport terminal, do you? Or a smiling airport terminal. You never hear that. They're talking to Ken, and... Uh, Thing. I'm telling you this for your own good, or I'm only rude to people I like, or if you don't mind me saying so. Well, Pauline says, I had a friend who used to say, I'm not being nasty, but... and then proceeded to make the most insulting remarks. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why people think they can get away with it. It was on a Thursday morning that the BA came to call with trays of cakes and pastries to make the waistline sprawl, and so upon arrival at the terminal boarding gate, you'll have some excess baggage, if not some extra weight. I'm indebted to Richard and Dawn Woodhouse, uh, writing from uh, La Rue de Samar, Saint-Clement, in uh, Jersey, in the Channel Islands. And they've, they've been to New Zealand. And um, they've sent me a picture of a headstone. Uh, Hokitika was the place where they went to visit the cemetery. And it says, in loving memory of Samuel Wogan, died the 30th of March, 194. I didn't know that we'd spread this far as the Southern Hemisphere, but apparently we did. Anyway, I was... Oh, hang on. I was reading with some envy as I tucked into my pot noodle last night, says Rob Sinfield, and indeed no more than myself and the rest of us here who were not invited to the ground levé at Windsor, Windsor Castle. I mean, there were lots of people there, you know, and you think, well... Hmm. The menu for the state banquet for Nicolas Sarkozy and his bevy of French beauties... Uh, that Minister for Human Rights. Whoa. Anyway, <laughs> Rob says, I noticed a vegetarian option. Quail's eggs embedded in herb nests with ravioli and wild mushrooms. Very nice, but isn't an egg a baby bird? No, no, you're confusing vegetarian with vegan, Rob Sinfield. And since neither of us were asked, and none of us are out here anyway, could we care less? So, yo, yo yourself, Len, uh, yo baggy. So yesterday, when B.A.'s problem seemed so far away, we had such a fuss here yesterday with lovely girls from British Airways giving us all sorts of goodies and praise of Terminal 5, and then we all know what happened. Anyway, according to Len, uh, uh, baggage performance problems. That's at the root of the problem of the new 4.3 billion Terminal 5. So, says Len, it's the bag's fault, then. Yeah, I think we'll find that it isn't anybody's fault. It'll, it'll be the bag's. I think you should know, says Lou Smarles, there's a job vacancy in the new Terminal 5 building at Heathrow for a person to be in charge of baggage handling. The post would be ideal for someone who's either a failed whelk stall owner or unable to organise a knees up in a brewery. And, and here's the good news and the bad news. The good news is you can shop till you drop and eat, drink and be merry. Unfortunately, the things you can't do at Terminal 5 is catch a plane. Or oh, find your luggage. On the other hand, we here at the BBC are not ones to scoff because we break every pane of glass in the glass house. 
because Frank of Stevenage has got hold of the news, and indeed it appears to be true, and the BBC has lost folders with addresses, passport numbers, pictures and hotel details of the 437 staff who are going for the Olympic Games to Beijing. How many? And I see Gordon Brown got lost at Windsor Castle the other night. <laughs> Loose morals. <laughs> yes, I know. This is no, following a sequence that will go into. Why doesn't he get lost? He, quite. I've seen reporters standing in floods on the seaside in stormy conditions. And yesterday, Sir Stan Birchall. This really does get up our noses, doesn't it? Why are we so stupid that we don't know that conditions, when you say it's a stormy sea, we know what a stormy sea looks like. And we don't have to have somebody standing in it. Yeah. Well, this Channel 5 reporter was sta- on a thatched roof reporting on the shortage of wheat straw for thatching. <laughs> Stands it. I'm sure it's possible we may yet see a reporter standing in the middle of a fire telling us how hot it is as it melts the microphone. Uh, a few years ago, in a bout of devil-may-care, I purchased a trinket of dubious intrinsic value. It looked good on paper. If that's so, Murphy. Amid a great fanfare, I unwrapped it. It worked for ten minutes and then failed like a cheap Christmas present. You see, I wonder what the chairman of BA and BAA are getting for spending five million on something that looked good on paper. I'd say a hefty bonus, probably. Just saying to Sarah Kennedy, and we wish her a happy weekend, that she'd be lying down in a darkened room as the rest of us trying to restore our tissues, and that uh, some of the paper's behaviour over the arrival of uh, uh, Sarkozy and his lady wife. Is she a wife yet? I don't know. Well, whatever she is, uh, Carla Bruni, she's carried herself with great dignity and great beauty. And why they have to show pictures of her in the nude? It's just... <laughs> Despicable, isn't it? Now, Mr. Sarkozy wants to have a breakfast with us. Will it be the full English one with British bangers? Oh, or will it be one of those horrible continental ones with the dodgy French toast? Jocks are the mighty, that is. Oh. <laughs> the rashers. That's what you want, is a rasher. Bonjour, quel dommage. What? You mean quel dommage, do you? Possibly you don't, Gilly Oxborough. Agencourt has been forgotten, and Monsieur Ticozzi and his nice wife, Carla Brudy, have paid us a visit. Probably won't be long before they produce some enfants cordial. There's no need to speculate quite that far. Get a grip. I thought you might be interested in the following snippet of conversation. Well, I, I was interested watching last night with Matthew Norman, who's obviously the BBC's no money, but it's sending Matthew Norman around to stuff his face. I don't know on whose behalf, but there you are. And, you know, enunciating clearly and, and somewhat pompously on the food. And uh, in Northern Irony was last night, and uh, indeed Ed MacDonald of Ballymena says, I was dining out in a restaurant in Bushmills the other evening. Oh, that's a fine drop too. The waitress arrived to take our food order, and when it came my brother's turn, he, he, the wait, conversation with the waitress went something like this. And what can I get for you, sir? I'll have a sirloin steak, please. Certainly, sir. How would you like that cooked? A medium rare, please. Certainly, sir. Sides? Oh, oh, both sides, please. If you find life a bore in Terminal 4, try and survive in Terminal 5. That's not helpful at all, John. That's it. It's just blame the baggage. That's the main thing. And carry. Carry cell. Once again, we lead the world. Show them how it's done. First, Wembley Stadium, now Terminal 5 Heathrow. Our unerring ability to get it right must make the rest of the planet look on in disbelief. I put it down to meticulous planning and attention to detail. And what a shame they allowed themselves to be bullied out of fingerprinting everyone. I'm sure that would have even helped even more the smooth running of that slick operation. And Isla... I the man TT says, I've just heard a very moving story which I'd like to share with your other listener. Well, y- you know, okay, Isla. A woman has twins, gives them up for adoption. One of them goes to a family in Egypt and is named Amal. And the other goes to a family in Spain. They name him Juan. Years later, Juan sends a picture of himself to his birth mother. Upon receiving the picture, she tells her husband she wishes she also had a picture of Amal. And the husband replies, they're twins! 
If you've seen one, you've seen them all. We have faithful listeners here at Havering, are you Havering or Havering? Havering College, a lively debate of what you wear to present your show, simple enough, tricorn hat. Uh, the full, the full coat, of course. The morning coat, and the, the white tie, the tails, and the, the impeccable Mechlin lace at my cuff, if you want to know. That's the HR department. You're in a state, are you, Havering in Essex? Oh, thank you. I, I was saddened to hear about British Airways' problems with Terminal 5, and I'd just like to say... <laughs> oh, it's from Sir Richard Branson. Ah, do excuse me while I compose myself. Schadenfreude is so unbecoming, yes, and so hard to spell. And I just wanted to say that maybe the problem came from diverting efforts from running the service into silly little stunts like providing cakes for radio presenters. No, no, that is not a silly stunt. That is a very, very welcome gesture, and uh, I can only <laughs> express extraordinary surprise that it didn't lead to a smooth running of the of the new terminal. You'll never catch me, says Sir Richard, making a stunt of myself to promote my excellent Virgin Airlines or my equally excellent Virgin Trains, would you? Kind wishes. Bus link available from rugby during the engineering works. Uh, making the mistake of having the old idiot box on while breakfasting, that'll put you off your wheaty bangs, I noted that on the review of the papers, the Times was claiming an exclusive. <laughs> With a picture... <laughs> of President Sarkozy kissing his wife on the pleasure boat. <laughs> this may be the sort, the sort of thing considered acceptable in Le Monde and on La Seine, but not in dear old Blighty. On the front page of the Thunderer, I too true. <laughs> this is Grace. Wake up to Rogan! This was a podcast from BBC Radio 2. Don't forget you can also download free podcasts for Steve Wright, Russell Brand and Chris Evans. Get more information now at bbc.co.uk slash radio2 and wake up to Wogan every weekday morning from 7.30, online, on digital and on 88 to 91 FM.